I'm one of the research theme leaders for the uh, causal inference theme. Ben Yu. Okay. So thank you for uh, having me speak. So I'm presenting the theme on causal inference of the FAUCI New Institute. I'm very excited to be part of this great team of people actually from both East Coast and West Coast. You can see the photos of my team. So in the interest of time, I won't go through them, but um, the names that I'm co-leading is, is Professor Shah from MIT. So the uh, plan for this theme is really design experimentation to infer causal relationships and also work with observational data to infer the aggregated potential outcomes and the hypothetical experimentation. In particular, we're interested in high dimensional covariates dealing with deep end data with network inference, uh, interference for causal inference and related is through graphical models and synthetic controls, reinforcement learning, and also checking assumptions using data in observational studies. So that's where um, we are um, positioned to work on. And for the rest of the talk, I'd like to share one project uh, my group just finished and in the realm of uh, causal inference. So this is, um, we call stable discovery interval subgroup wear calibration. And it's really, again, um, effort of a group of collaborators and two young, very talented scientists leading the project, Raz uh, Davidi from my group and also joined the co-vice with Martin Renwright and Yan Shu Tang, who was actually the last uh, tripod postdoc still uh, with us in Berkeley. And the two senior colleagues are uh, David Madigan from Northeastern and myself, and also we have two members from the group, uh, Britton and Mia, and also a physician a scientist joining us, uh, Kevin. Oops. So this is a project really tried to um, work on precision medicine. It's defined by CDC as genes, behavior, environment that affect our health. And we want the interventions and treatment diagnosis to be tailored to individuals or at least subgroups, not just uh, for the whole population. In particular, our work is addressing precision medicine for drugs. That how do we figure out whether the drug is effective? Traditionally, FDA pay attention to average treatment effect. But now the field is moving to heterogeneous treatment. In fact, really try to address a pre precision medicine problems. In particular, we have access to data from clinical trial about 20 years ago. Something is um, anti-inflammatory drug called Wilox. So Wilox was one of the so-called non-selective anti-inflammatory drugs that, but it can inst Increase the risk of GI events like ulcers and bleeding, and also found to might not be so good for cardiovascular um, health. And um, however, it's kind of new, and um, people thought it might be better than the non-selective one. So they target more specific enzymes um, or proteins than the selective NSAID, which is the control in this study. So the trial started 1990, and um, Merck put it out in 2004, and there's kind of a little reversal, try to say that maybe can return to market. What we're aiming to do, because overall has been proven that it's not good for the whole population or the broader, whatever, under the study, but we're looking for some uh, groups that maybe can kind of control the feedbacks, control the drawbacks, but at the same time, um, make it useful for people. And we take this predictive stable interval approach. As I said, this is about 8,000 patients. They're not just healthy people. They're actually patients with rheumatoid arthritis and uh, recruited from 300 centers in 22 countries. And the control arm is another older drug called naproxen. And you can see that relative naproxen, the GI event, um, we all, we all seem to be better, but for the um, cardiovascular event, it's worse. This is just some basic notation for the uh, name and Rubin framework. We assume a superpopulation and we have uh, ID observation, both the covariance and the uh, randomization mechanism TI and the two potential outcomes coming from a superpopulation. And we have um, these randomized trials. Traditionally, people are interested in average treatment effect, which is called tau. And recent work has been concentrating on conditional average treatment effect as a way to deal with 
heterogeneous treatment effect. You condition a particular covariate and you look at the average treatment effect for that group, or you can generalize that to a group, not just a particular um, uh, patients with a particular covariate or feature X. There has been a lot of research recently, including um, people from Berkeley and our work with Jess Sikang and Peter Bickle and our joint student, Kuzang, we divide X learner. Before us, people already have something X learner using basically borrowing machine learning from um, the supervised learning and turn the ATE, no, actually this is Kate estimating into estimating the uh, potential outcome for both groups and take that. Uh, difference and go that way. And there's also our learner from the um, Stanford and there's trade, trade learner. So I won't have time to really give you the detail, but just like this has been a flurry of works. And many actually tree-based, uh, causal tree, uh, causal forest and BART, which is a Bayesian version of tree. So you have num numerous number of choices for modeling and you can combine them in different ways. So the X and R learner, you can also take different base learners, different supervised methods have a combinatorial number of possibilities and tuning parameters. So it's a huge uh, arsenal of estimating Kate. And the problem with missing potential outcome is that we never observe two at the same time because you usually got randomized into one or the other. How do you check a model like um, reality check? And we have very imbalanced data as well because these events uh, happen quite rarely. So our current contributions actually extend a framework. Uh, me and my group have been developing and collaborating called PCS, which I'll tell you in the next slides, from supervised learning to causal studies. And we introduce calibration-based predictive checks for Kate models. And we depend on this particular interval methodology because that disk uh, to use Kate models, we have 17 of them actually, and many different ways to perturb the data to find stable and integral and predictive groups for heterogeneous effect. And we found six subgroups. And after we submit the first version of the paper, actually we had access to another study, it's kind of as external validation to show that the four of the groups we find still hold up in this new study and new to us and two groups that the other study is smaller that just doesn't have information to say one way or the other neither confirm or refute our uh, found subgroups. So the PCS from some of you might have heard that I've been talking about this for the last couple of years. It's really, I think, related to FOSI in the sense that we need to do a lot more theoretical work. But right now, it's a conceptual fundamental work that I try to combine machine learning with statistics. So predictivity very much taken from both machine learning and statistics. Machine learning made predictability at the center, but predictability was always there in statistics and computability very much um, taken, you know, made central to data analysis by machine learning and stability is a generalization of uncertainty concept to the whole entire data science life cycle. And this is basically three components, try to bridge environments to cultures, unify streamlines, expand some ideas and best practice from both machine learning and statistics. So the PCS framework connects science and engineering. For me, data science is both engineering and science. Predictability and stability embed two very important scientific principles, prediction and replication. And computability is a generalization of this reach of convergence com uh, computation, computational science type of view in the sense that we do that, care about scalable computation, but also we want to introduce data inspired simulation to argument uh, the data we have observed. And I started working on this path, um, I think like seven, eight years. The first paper I wrote was stability, was a two key lecture, really try to connect the sample to sample variability or perturbation with two keys, robust statistics. So this is very much, you know, very much related to the robust statistics. I did the reason I didn't use the word robust because robust statistics has a particular meaning already in statistics. It's very much the robust statistic idea. I also generalize to the whole data science life cycle have interoperability, reproducibility, and hypothesis generation as a first step to our causal inference. Uh, it applies to the whole data science lifecycle and recognize the judgment calls we make every step of the way. For example, what our address here is, we already designed the data, right? We have also got 
external validation data from the approved study. Uh, how do you featureize? How do you take the threshold? You have different choices and you should do the perturbation to make sure your conclusion is robust. And what metrics you're gonna evaluate the different subgroups and what data perturbation you're gonna do, right? You do cross validation and how you set data aside. And as I said, we end up looking at 17 different Kate algorithms. Would they give the same results? So we want to use predictability as model checking or reality check to screen certain algorithm then seek stability among the ones past the screening. And interpretation, we want for stable and clinically meaningful subgroups. So it's easier to understand. I think that will enhance the transferability as well. So in particular, we worked on 16 binary features. Actually, some of them already bin um, came binary, but many we binarize. So you have a threshold problem. How do you cut at older population and the younger? And we took two thresholds and studied those. And uh, end up with 16 binary vectors. And the way we perturb the data is we call have 12 settings. So we set aside a test set, we don't touch, and then we turn into four fold. And then we make one fold, the validation fold within the training. And then for the three training folds, we actually also um, re-split three times. So we created 12 possible splits or data perturbations. And then we look at for each model, so this is one of the uh, X learner with space learner random forest and cross learner lasso, that you look at vertically, look at the groups in terms of the predicted or estimated uh, heterogeneous estimates through Kate and cut it into, we cut into five groups. And then we look at the training folds and validation folds. And the model Kate means you use the model, which is a random forest underneath it, and the soup, and that's the average, the blue curve. And then you look at just this subgroup and look at the name and Kate, it means you just do the difference of this group. And then the same for the validation fold. You can see that the lower group is pretty stable and the second group, not so much. So that indicates that maybe we should look at the first G1, this group seems to have a clear benefit for um, uh, Wilkes relative to uh, naproxen, the two drugs. And then this is just visual. We develop something like generalized R square for using the validation fold to, to see really how well um, the model does relative to just like the vanilla subgroup uh, difference in means and then the global uh, ATE. So this is really try to generalize something like ANOVA but using the test or the validation set, not test, sorry, validation to have this score. Because it's using the validation fold, it's not between zero and one as traditional R squared, but it can be minus infinity to one. Close one's still good, but it can get pretty bad if the model doesn't fit very well. I mean, the coefficient just adjusts the group size, so that things are more comparable. So if you look at the 17 Kate models, oh, you can see that overall things don't work that well. Right, a lot of them um, not really much better than the, um, it's a big spread and the validation said you have really varied performance. Sometimes it's R square, which coming is quite negative. You want to be close to one, we barely have anything close to one. And same for the vascular uh, event, V uh, CVT. And each data point here is, remember I have um, 12 data perturbation schemes. So the, each data perturbation scheme give me one score. So we, we're seeking stability again. The takeaway is that the Kate model do not have good generalization on the whole data set, but the bottom quantile based subgroup for both events or the top quantile group for the uh, cardiovascular event are relatively stable and cross 70 models. But each, because remember I'm cutting based on the estimated Kate surface. So that depends on which surface you cut, you end up with different subgroups, right? The next steps are which Kate models to use to identify subgroups and how to turn subgroup into clinically uh, interpretable subgroups. Any questions?
So what we end up doing again, rely on predictability and stability. Of course, all this has to be done computationally with many parallel. Um, it's very easy to parallelize. So we have lots of lots of uh, parallelized uh, calculation to get the results. So you take a particular model M and particular data per perturbation, remember we had 12 of them. And then we want to have more standardized measures so we can compare compare across different models and different perturbation through this almost like a T statistic using the, um, um, the validation uh, set. So, and we also want to know how big the bottom group you should take, right? We have five groups and you can just keep increasing that. So I also look at the first bottom group, put the first and second together and so on and so forth. So we have this aggregated kind of measure for each model and each data perturbation through this almost like T-statistic compared with the average treatment effect ATE and to see this subgroup is that really different in the right direction and uh, relative to the average treatment effect standardized by the standard error. So now we have 17 different models Kate model, which I don't have time to tell you the details, but it's different groups developed. And then we take the original split and then this T statistic. So each perturbation and each model end up with this T score and we list 17 of them. And the first one, actually the best one for this case is actually um, um, T learner with logistic kind of base learner inside that. And the X learner, you can see most ones, all the ones on uh, are X learners. And we did more perturbations. We did, remember we fixed the fold and then for the training folds, we did the two random more splits. And we also split the data based on the enrollment time to mimic a bit external uh, validation from the same trial, but we didn't split just randomly. We split based on the time and enrollment of patients, of course, you know, stratified. And then we also perturb the data based on how we set the threshold, how we define like 60 year old above being older or 65. And also how you set uh, BMI to cut as obese or not. And also how do you define the outcome? There's some ambiguity. So we also perturb that to make sure that our conclusion doesn't depend on this arbitrary human judgment calls we made in the process of kind of futurization or data cleaning. So we end up with seven different perturbations and with these T scores. And they're not, they're comparable, but not exactly comparable because the details of the models are very different. So we end up using the ranking we believe is more robust to compare these different model performance. And we end up uh, finding six models, which seem to be appearing above on top of the list across different perturbations. So you take each method and you look at seven different rankings and look at the top 10, who gets out, we have 17 of them. And these six models, tend to be consistently in the top 10, ranking using the T-statistic. And they are actually mostly the X learners, which actually to my nice surprise, because this is developed by um, my group and collaborators. Actually in the beginning, this is pretty kosher in the sense that in the beginning, actually we didn't use X learner. For some reason, uh, the students in the group decide not to use X learner. And now it's just for the sake of understanding the method developed by my group and collaborators and say, well, why didn't you guys also try X learner since I just wanted to see how it performs. It turns out to be um, performing really well. And the T learner, which means two trees, that means you just fit the outcome for the treatment group and also fit the outcome for the control group and then do the cross. That works really well. That's also in our X learner paper, we also find that T learner works really well. So that's what we have. Now we have, we finally find use predictive screening it's kind of reflected in the T statistics. And we also saw quite a bit of uh, stability across different perturbations and visualization. And uh, end up with six models. And now we basically took the ensemble, the average of the six K models and get ensemble K estimator. 
And the next step, because again, this is a, just a continuous surface. You cut vertically, you're not gonna end up with a nice like rectangle region in terms of your, uh, your space or easily describable. So we also have another layer of um, algorithms, the C to find interpretable rectangle regions by constraining the values of some features. We kind of allow, you can, for each decision rule, you can only use three features out of 16. Otherwise we worry about too much um, time to search and also just hard to describe. So we want simplicity and we also want uh, stable disjoint cells. So what do we end up with is, um, this is just a summary, right? As I said, PCS is a framework my group has developed for the last almost 10 years. And we had five, four motivating projects. And now we did three new projects, which after the framework was set in terms of the paper published by myself and my former student Count Combeer early this year. So we first one for PCS, predictability to screen models and compare multiple models, 17 of them, and multiple perturbation, we have 12 of them. And then we seek this T statistic kind of metric to really rank the different models within one perturbation and use ranking as the metric to pull the different seven different perturbation together. So it's quite a bit of work. And then we went for easily interpretable decision rules in terms of a cell search that each cell can only rely on three out of the 16 um, predictors or features. And now we got a clinical interval subgroups. So that's what we got. We found six groups. Remember we had two events. The uh, naproxen is also an anti-inflammatory drug. It's an older drug. And this is the control arm. So saying Weox is better doesn't mean compared with the, the, the healthy people is better, but this is what, um, how the clinical trial was done. So we found that if the patients have his history of GI event, then Weox disproportionately reduced GI risk for patients. Also, if the group of patients with history of hypertension and prior uses of steroids, the third group is old age and prior uses of steroids. So these three groups overlap. Together, they consist about 30% of the um, patients in the uh, study. And the overlap is it's about, I think, uh, 70 to 80%. So it's, there's quite a bit of overlap. No, sorry, about 30%. I got it reversed. And then for the cardiovascular event, we actually find th other three subgroups. History of this is basically plug in your heart artery, atherosclerosis. The other group is uses aspirin. That's probably meaning that you already um, have some um, blood uh, clotting problem. That's why you're taking aspirin. Because one problem we find is that uh, proxin can really, um, I think, clot the blood. So make things worse for people who already have um, blood clotting problem. That's why I think the first Merck put out the drug from the market. And the third group is old age and male gender. And for the, the last group is the st uh, STAR. It just actually, um, we validated these groups in the test data. Remember we set aside with all the perturbation that is all done with training data, but the, 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 um, the sixth group, we, we cannot really uh, see much in the test data, just not no event. Then we submitted the paper uh, to International Institute of Review. It was a special issue for uh, Brad Efren's uh, international prize he got last year. And um, we decided to look for external validation. So even it's randomized trials, right? It's the gold standard. But as you have seen, the study subjects were not randomly selected population eventually the drug will be used for. It's a particular group of patients with uh, health problems. And as said, famous by Cochrane, between measurement based on RCT, randomized clinical trial and benefit in the community, there's a gulf which has been much underestimated. So the different populations are very different. And um, one study open result that have been 
David Madigan and I have shown and collaborators shown that some drugs you see different studies you have conflicting conclusions. There are differences in populations and clinical monitoring. It's different who gets admitted, who doesn't. So all of that can cause things not transferable from one study to the other. So the approved study was a later study with smaller uh, number of patients. But for this, the treatment still works, but the control farm is placebo. So um, their primary purpose is really reduce the risk of polyps in individuals with a recent history of these tumors. So it's a different aim, but still uh, it's relevant because you also look at Wilx. And um, however, the trial was terminated early because the high cardiovascular toxicity and uh, withdraw the drug from the market. Even in the beginning of this, they were thinking about putting it back to the market. So because we had a very interpretable uh, rules from subgroups, it's very easy to compare. Otherwise the things are not very comparable. It's just more stable. And we asked, did the subgroups find by our method for the Vigor study, the first study, generalized to the approved study? And the good news is that mostly yes, as I mentioned earlier. Four out of six subgroups show significant heterogeneous treatment effect in the approved study. And the heterogeneous treatment effect with the other two groups cannot be confirmed or refuted. There's just no data for the approved study. So the six group I have shown you, you can see with the check marks that they are confirmed. It's not exactly validated because the study design is different. We're comparing with a placebo here, not with another drug. And the two groups didn't get uh, confirmed is because we have no event, so it didn't get refuted either. So this was a very nice um, study for us to confirm what we discovered because you never know that you really finding things only work for the you know, people in the study, but this give us more confidence that the subgroups hold. So to summarize, this is really a particular case study of this PCS framework. However, we had to do work to generalize supervised learning in terms of the P predictability to cause a study through calibration because you never observe both potential outcomes. And we have a calibration based predict checks for Kate models. And we look at 17 different models and 12 different perturbations to really come up with a stable and integral methodology to find six groups. And um, the approved study, it's really a very nice uh, confirmation of what we find. And it's really not exactly eternal validity because the designs are different, but it's a very strong evidence to support the methodology and the subgroups we find. So I hope it will be useful more as a general methodology developed with this uh, random trial, randomized uh, clinical trial data. And the two papers at my website, the first actually have a name called Ver Vertical Data Science, which is really the PCS paper. And the second paper uh, is also there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. So we have uh, one minute before the, the break. If there, anybody has questions, you're welcome to post those in the Q&A. Otherwise, um, I think Jesse will be posting the uh, GatherTown link again. There it is. Uh, and if you'd like to click on that and meet up in GatherTown, we can do that. So we're starting again in 15 minutes, 15 minutes time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thank Ben. That was great. Thank you. I guess I can hang up for 15 minutes before I have to disappear again.